Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study and prayer. We want to uh, start off by just saying thank you. Thank you for those who have been giving of your tithes and offerings. I appreciate your faithfulness to the Lord. And I'll take that opportunity as well to just to remind everyone to be faithful in that area. Uh, the missionaries are still needing our support and we want to be in prayer for our missionaries. I'm sure you have a list of them there. I won't take time uh, to read through all that list, but we do want to just welcome you and encourage you to keep on keeping on for God. Stay in the, your Bible, read your Bible, pray daily, and uh, seek to be obedient in tithes and offerings. Seek to be obedient in witnessing for Christ. So let's... Uh, uh, just uh, just give a few announcements here I'd like to give you this, this evening. Um, and really, there's not a lot, but I will reiterate what I've stated on Sunday, that Lord willing, we plan to open the church doors on May the 3rd. May the 3rd, we're going to open the church doors and encourage those who would like to come to come, but only if you're healthy. If you're not feeling well, if you're not comfortable getting out, stay home. We understand. Uh, we're still going to try to record the services uh, for those who cannot be here. But uh, uh, we are going to open the church. We're going to, uh, you know, if you would like to wear a mask, that's fine. If you, But we'll do the social distancing. Uh, we'll keep things uh, wiped down and clean here. And um, uh, we'll just, you know, of course, not be shaking hands. But uh, Lord willing... We'll open the church for those who can come on May the 3rd. I, I also want to uh, just go through a few prayer requests here tonight. Actually, I think what I'll do rather than go through the prayer request is just go right into prayer uh, for the sake of time. And there are many requests, and I have some before me. And so you pray along with me as we pray and let God uh, just have his way with your heart. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that tonight we can come before you. Uh, again, we're reminded that you're a God who hears our prayers and you're able to answer our prayers. Father, we're thankful that you're sovereign, you're in control. And I just ask that you'd help us to trust you, Lord. May our faith be increased in these days when our schedule, our livelihood has been uh, just, just changed completely. And I pray that we'd learn to trust you. I do pray for the situation in our country, in our state. I pray that we'd be able to get back to work and people's um, jobs and their businesses would uh, start picking back up. God, just meet those needs. Uh, there's more than just the need of our health. Uh, there's uh, obviously a need for uh, people in this economy that, uh, God, they would do well and be able to get back and they're working and, and providing for their families. But uh, most importantly, help us, help us not to forget the spiritual need of those around us. And Father, I do pray for all of our Sunday school teachers and officers. God, encourage their hearts and bless them, strengthen them, our deacons, all of our officers. Pray for um, the uh, needs of, of some that are, have not been well, like Kathy Avalon on the mission field. Be with her as she battles this lupus. I pray for Ernest and Benny Best. Lord, as they also battling health issues and just meet their needs, be, be with Lori Klo and also uh, not only her health, but the loss of her sister. I pray that you just meet her needs, encourage her heart, Lord. Pray for uh, Ron and Jean Corley. God, help them as, as they are um, also dealing with health, health issues on the mission field. Pray for Rudy and Flo Ann. Thank you for them. I pray you continue to meet their needs there at uh, Hickory Estates, as well as Nancy Killam living there. Pray for uh, Pastor Steve Flock. Uh, continue to strengthen him, Lord, meet his needs. And then uh, Morris and Luella Hubbard, pray for them. Pray for Lori Hutchison, Lord, that you'd meet her needs as she's been in a lot of pain lately. Give the doctors wisdom. May they be able to uh, get this MRI and uh, accomplished here soon, Lord. Pray for Mary Lou Keller. Thank you for her improvement. And pray for uh, Jerry Rhodes is battling this cancer and Clyde and Judy Schoonover who've uh, been in bad health. And pray for uh, Junior Trainer there at the Heritage Health Nursing Home. 
and uh, just meet his needs. And Susan Vermas and, and many others, Lord. Um, I think of uh, Jill Spencer, whose surgery has been put off. Pray that this could be rescheduled here soon and she can get this work done that needs to be done. And I do uh, also pray for the unspoken re request. We pray for uh, our church, that it would grow, that, uh, that uh, all of us would be faithful in our ties to make sure that nothing uh, falls behind. I pray that we would see uh, many more people reached with the gospel and, and uh, this church grow and prosper for your glory. I do pray for our country, be with our president and our vice president and those in leadership. And God, may politics be put aside, may the, what is best for our country, what is right for the people, uh, be uh, on the forefront of everyone's heart and mind. So you bless and, and watch over them, Lord. May they make the right decisions. And God, there's just so many decisions that are made that we don't see the common sense or the reason for it. And I just pray that common sense would uh, uh, take the rule and they would just do what is right. So you got in direct in these days, Lord. May we look to you and honor you and glorify you in all that we do and say. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Also want to mention we're thankful for Andrew and Sean Canavan that was with us this past Sunday night. And I want to encourage you when you have an opportunity. We have prayer cards here for the two of them. Uh, pick that prayer card up as they're trying to get to Ireland. Did a great job on Sunday night, and we appreciate uh, their ministry. Now, if you would, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 26. We're going to pick up here again where we left off last week in chapter 26, 1 Samuel 26. And we see in this chapter the storm has returned upon David. Just when we thought that Saul had come to his senses back in chapter 24, when he uh, admitted that he was wrong in pursuing David, when he acknowledged that, yes, David would be the rightful king of Israel, just when it looked like things were going well, he now returns like some unwanted storm upon the horizon. Saul had lost all sense of honor and virtue. Let's read the first five verses of 1 Samuel 26. And uh, we'll, we'll start there anyway. And as the Lord gives us time, we'll uh, try to get through this chapter. And the Ziphites came unto Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself in the hill of Hecala, which is before Jeshimon? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul pitched in the hill of Hecala, which is before Jeshimon, by the way. But David abode in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul was come in very deed. And David rose and came to the place where Saul had pitched, and David beheld the place where Saul lay, and Abner the son of Ner, the captain of his host, and Saul lay in the trench, and the people pitched round about him. So Saul gets information of David's movements, and he acts offensively. David gets information of Saul's movements, and he acts defensively. Once again, we see the heart of David. It was not to do what David wanted, the heart of David was to do the will of God. David re relied upon the Spirit of God to guide him. David did not live by fear, but rather by faith. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. And David had a perfect love of God. He also loved Saul. And therefore there was no fear in his heart. And though Saul was David's enemy, David still loved him. And likewise, we must today rely upon the Spirit of God to guide us, and we must not be governed by fear, but rather by uh, faith in God. Let's not be governed by our hatred and revenge for those that have wronged us. Like Gideon, David ventures through these, uh, this, these guards here around Saul, and um, he had no fear at all. Uh, was, he he had, uh, uh, was not being led by his revenge, but by rather by his love. 
And so he had the assurance also of the Lord's divine protection. There was no fear on, on David's part because he knew God was over watching over and protecting him. Now we must trust God for the unknowns. And my, there are many unknowns in our life. And we must choose to allow his love to flow through us to the rest of the world. Now this encounter, it's very similar to what we see uh, or what we saw happen back in chapter 24 uh, when he was in the cave there in En Gedi. David got so close to Saul, you may re remember that how he even cut off a, a piece of Saul's robe. And, um, and in this chapter, he takes Saul's spear and his, his uh, water jug, you could say. And so both times, David could have easily ended his misery by taking Saul out, but he did not. David knew that the choice to kill Saul did not belong to him, but rather it belonged to God, God alone. Therefore, he could not be coerced or talked into taking Saul's life. It was a deliberate decision on David's part not to kill Saul. The guiding principle is clear. It was not God's will. In verse 6, look what it says there. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Now how can we keep from playing the part of the fool? You see, the, I, I, I get this uh, title out of verse 21. We'll see that in a little bit here. But I have played the fool. Those are the words of, of King Saul. But how do we keep from playing the part of the fool? Number one, by making the right choices. By making the right choices. Make choices that reflect God's will. If David can do it, then so can you and I. By God's grace, let's choose to do God's will. It not only glorifies God, but it also blesses us. The Ziphites, they informed Saul that David was hiding nearby, and Saul comes with a great force of 3,000 men to uh, comb the area. He had uh, been taking this huge army to pursue one man, David. Now that's a, there's a really sad point here. Think about it. David takes 600 men to fight the real enemy, the Philistines, and defends Keilah in 1 Samuel 23. But Saul now takes 3,000 men to hunt one of his own, David. David got news that Saul had come, that uh, Saul was camped nearby. And so here, here's the interesting part. He decides to infiltrate the camp to go into the camp in the, in the middle of the night. And, and here, again, he took one of his men, Abishai, he sneaks into Saul's camp at yeah. night. Look. Then answered David and said to uh, Amalek, the Hittite, and to Abishai, the son of Zer Uri, uh, brother to Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul to the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with thee. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping with, within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay round about him. So everyone was in a deep sleep that God had brought upon them. And then uh, said Abishai to David. Now this is interesting. Here they are in the middle of the camp. Saul, they're standing right over Saul, all of his men are around, and they're just having a conversation as if no one uh, can hear and, and uh, no one's going to be bothered. I believe they already sensed that God had put the people to sleep, that there was no, there was, they, they were pretty much captured uh, in their sleep. And so here Abishai says to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand uh, this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray thee, with a spear even to the earth at once, and I uh, will not smite him the second time. Here uh, Abishai says, David, I'm going to do a clean job. I'm going to kill him. It's only going to take one time. I won't have to do it a second time, and I'll, I'll uh, finish this nuisance. And God has, has paved the way for us to do this, David. 
Now, you can't blame Abishai. Think about it. This is the natural impulse in all of us. David had six reasons to kill Saul that night. Saul is the guilty one. David was the victim of all these wrongdoings. He also, number two, he's had a good, he had good opportunity to kill him. He has the weapon uh, needed to kill him. And number four, he has the man to do it. Number five, he has the support of his comrades. And number six, he has the extremely high chance of success. Everything screams at him. David, just do it. Do it. Kill him. But that's everything that comes from the flesh. It is the desires of the flesh. Galatians 5.16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Rely on the Spirit of God to guide and direct in your life. David was against killing Saul. He, was, he wasn't there for this. This was not his goal. This was not the will of God, and David knew it. Now listen to what he's, David says here in, in verses 9 through 11, and I think you'll sense the uh, reprimand that's coming from David to his men. And um, verse 9, And David said to Abishai, Destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, Furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his uh, day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. But I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is in uh, that is at his bolster and the cruise of water and let us go. Again, uh, very similar, similar to what happened in chapter 24 where he cut off a piece of the robe and uh, he was uh, conscience stricken there. He even felt bad about taking off a piece of that robe and he rebuked his men for wanting to kill Saul there in chapter 24. But clearly, killing Saul wasn't his goal. And he gives two reasons why this was not his goal, to kill Saul. It wasn't his place, first of all. Who can stretch, he says there in verse 9, who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And the obvious answer to that question is no one. Even if Saul is ungodly, even if Saul is corrupt, he is still God's anointed. And no one can take his life without guilt. Number two, it wasn't the right time. Not only was it wasn't his place, but it wasn't the right time. In verses 10 and 11, he states there, The Lord shall smite him, or his days shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. And so pretty much what David is saying here is, I don't know when. I don't know how God will do it, but one thing is sure, it's not my job. And it's not our place to take revenge, even if you and I have been wronged. You say, well, it's my right. I've got a right. No, no, not as a believer in God. Not if you want to do the will of God. It's not my job to take vengeance. We, we cannot be sure what is considered a right judgment or when it is a right time. So this explains why God doesn't want us to take vengeance, to seek revenge. Leave that to him. God is capably perfect, uh, or is, is perfectly capable, I guess I got it backwards here, perfectly capable of righting all the wrongs that have been, been done to us. And he... Um, can do so in his own way, in his own time. Now, instead, David here, he asked Abishai to take Saul's spear and his, his um, uh, cruise of water, his water bottle, his jug. And imagine this, Abishai must have been thinking, what, we've, we've come all this way, through all this danger, to steal his water bottle? And, but no, we don't see him say that, but I could imagine that. Why do you think David took such a risk? Um, when killing Saul wasn't his objective here. Why did he go through all this trouble? David has something else in mind here, and it becomes very clear uh, as we read along. They cross back to the other side. David shouts over the valley and wakes everyone up. And David, he wakes up Abner first. Now, Abner was Saul's commander. 
Abner was the one that should have been guarding Saul. Listen to verses 14 and 16, or follow along there if you would. And David cried to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Answerest thou not, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who art thou that criest to the king? And David said to Abner, Art not thou a valiant man? And who is like to thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept thy lord the king? For there came one of the people in to destroy the king thy lord. This thing is not good that thou hast done. As the Lord liveth, ye are worthy to die, because ye have not kept your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is, and the cruise of water that was at his bolster. Twice Saul could have died. Once in the cave, and now here in this camp. And, and his men were not capable of protecting him. Now how, how ironic that is. Think about it. Saul is out to kill the one man who was most qualified, who was most capable of protecting him. How foolish of Saul. Now foolishness marks the one who has no fear of God in his heart. And David, then he speaks with Saul here. And by the way, this is the climax of the chapter here. This is the heart of the chapter. Um, David wants to talk to Saul. Listen to what he says in verses 18 through 20. And he said, Wherefore doth my Lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done, or what evil is in mine hand? Now therefore I pray thee, let my Lord the king hear the words of his servant. If the Lord have stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. But if they be the children of men, cursed be they before the Lord, for they shall, or they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord saying, Go serve other gods. Now therefore let not my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel is come out to seek a flea, as when one doth hunt a partridge in the mountains. David, here he wants to talk to Saul, and after all these four years, and this is pretty much what he's saying, after all these years, Saul, he still did not understand why the king hated him so much. And what, after all, David had done nothing against Saul. He had done him no wrong. So we don't always suffer for our own sin. Sometimes we suffer because of the sins of others. And um, most of the time, for no apparent reason, we may suffer. We just don't know. We just don't know. In verse 19, let me remind you what David said there. If the Lord have stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. In other words, what David is, is meaning here, if, if I'm guilty of some wrongdoing and God has sent you, Saul, to discipline me, then I'm willing to confess my sin. And, and I'm willing to offer a sacrifice to God. But he goes on, but if they be the children of men, cursed be they before the Lord. But he said, if this is not God, but it's men, let them be cursed. So we can keep from playing the part of the fool by making the right choices. Then number two, by trusting God. Allow me to read verses 21 to, the, to uh, verse 25 here. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return my son David, for I will no more uh, do, to, to, do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, Behold the king's spear, and let one of the young men come over and fetch it. The Lord rendered to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into mine hand today, but I would not stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes, so let my life be much set by in the, the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David, thou shalt... Both do great things, and also shall still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. Now, folks, we need to trust God for the unknown. How can we, again, keep from playing the part of the fool by making the right choices and by trusting God for all the unknowns? There is no simple answer here for David. But one thing David is sure of, look at verse 23. The Lord rendered every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. In other words, David says, the Lord will reward the uh, faithful. Now, 
We trust that God knows what he's doing, David says. We believe him. We trust him. And he will reward us according to our righteousness and according to our faithfulness. And one thing is clear, in all the years of running, David never lost his faith in God. He stays righteous. He stays faithful to God. He did not take matters into his own hands. He let God be God. David's trust in God is what made all the difference. He waits for God to work out his plan, even if that means he has to run for his life. And so there will be some unknowns in life. But we know that we, um, these, all these things, they're not unknown to God. They're unknown to us. But God knows everything. And he knows the future. And th that's uh, where trust comes in, or faith comes in. God will reward the righteous and the faithful. And Saul was moved by David's kindness, look at verse 21 again if you would. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return my son David, for I will no more do thee harm. Now, was, was Saul sincere here? Did he really mean what he said? Uh, we can't be sure, but Saul did stop his pursuit of David uh, after this happened. Uh, this, this would be their last meeting, in fact. Now, let me close with this thought here. David went into the, into the camp with a purpose in mind. Unlike chapter 24, where Saul came into that cave, David was already, already there, and it was by chance. Now, we know it was directed by God, but it was not planned by either of, the, of those two men. Sneaking into the camp, though, this was a deliberate act. This was a planned act. Why? Obviously not to kill him. We've already established the fact that David would not kill Saul. And was it to prove maybe that he would, uh, wouldn't have killed Saul even if he had a chance to do so? I, don't think so. I, I personally don't think so because he'd already done that there in the cave. Why would he risk his life to prove the point, um, the same point a second time? So David has something else in mind. And in it, it was worth taking the risk here. Why? Because he wants to talk to Saul. He wants to speak to him. He wants to get something off his chest. He, and, and that comes out in, in his words here. And I, I think it's best to, summed up here in the very last sentence that David speaks to Saul. And he says there in verse 24, as thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes. That phrase. As thy life was much set by this day in mine eyes. David was saying to Saul, I have valued your life. Your life is of great value to me. Um, and, and I don't think it just meant here that I, I didn't kill you today when I had the chance. No, the, the sense is that David wants Saul to know that he really cares about him. He is not Saul's enemy. David is telling Saul that he's important to him, that he really matters to him. And, and basically, David wants Saul to know that, Saul, I still love you, even after all this that's happened. He risked his life to find a chance to make this point to King, the King Saul. And so he wants Saul to know that despite all that has happened, his love for him has not changed. Did Saul get it? Did he understand what David was trying to say? Now, again, we can't be sure, but Saul's words to David uh, here are the most tender words that we hear coming out of his mouth in, since uh, from, from the point of him pursuing David. So he says, this uh, son of Jesse, this son of Jesse, who he talked uh, 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 spoke of David about before. He never even used David's name, if you recall, prior. Had such anger and, and hatred. Uh, didn't even use David's name. He said, the son of Jesse. But this son of Jesse has now become my son, David. There in verse 21. David's love appears to have changed Saul. David loved his enemy. And because of that, it made a great difference in Saul's life. Now, that's the love of Christ. And that's a choice 
that you and I make as well. We choose to let his love flow through us, or we choose not to allow his love to flow through us. David set a great example here for us to follow. How often do we go out of the way to tell someone that we care about them? How willing are we to show grace and to do, go, to do good to those that, even to those who offend us? 1 Peter 3, 9, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are there, uh, thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Is there someone in your life today that, or tonight that you need to show some love to? That you need to go to and just let them know how much they mean to you? Uh, to, not to not show love, to not allow the love of God to flow through us, I believe, is to be like Saul and to play the fool. Now, in the biblical sense, no believer can be a fool. But we can play the part of the fool by not obeying God, by not living in His will, and not allowing the love of Christ to flow through us. Don't be a fool. Don't play the part of a fool. Obey God. Do His will. Live for Him. Let His love flow through you. God bless you. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Father, Your will be done. Help us, Lord, to swallow our pride. I pray that we would not be governed by hatred and vengeance and and rather, Lord, that we would be governed by faith and allow your love to flow through us. And Lord, I pray that we would just truly examine our own lives to see if there be someone maybe that we feel has, has wronged us and, and we uh, need to approach them and just let them know how much we care for them, that we still love them, and that we uh, want to have a uh, right relationship with him. So God, your will be done in all of this and we give you the glory. If there be anyone here tonight that is listening there on the, this, to this video that is not saved, they're not sure that if they died right now they'd go to heaven. Oh, how I pray they'd call upon Jesus Christ to save their soul tonight. So your will be done for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And if you are there tonight listening and you're not saved, please call me. Uh, I'd love to help you in any way I can uh, and show you from the Bible how you can know for sure that you're born again, that you're going to heaven. God bless you, folks. Have a great night and a great rest of the week. Lord willing, we'll see you there uh, on uh, Sunday morning.